Welcome everyone to Finance 101. Hopefully you are here because you're, you're wanting to learn um, about the finance industry. What does it look like? What can you expect being a Georgetown student uh, and what it looks like for recruiting, networking, networking, and so on and so forth. So those are some of the things that I will be covering today. So, well, hold on, issues. Okay, so just a quick agenda. So we're going to talk about the different kinds of roles that Georgetown students commonly go into when it comes to uh, finance recruiting at the different firms. Um, I will highlight the different kinds of events that firms will be holding this semester. All of it will be virtual and it may look a little bit different, but actually for the most part, most things have stayed the same between last year and this year, even though we're in a virtual recruiting scenario. Uh, I'm going to give you a timeline of different firm events that you can look forward to. Some of these are on Handshake. Some of them are still slowly being put into Handshake, but this will roughly give you an idea of when to expect and what to expect. Uh, I'm going to go over how to network. Uh, I'm going to go through the process, what it looks like when you send an email, what it looks like when you have a phone call and all those different things. I'm going to point out some helpful resources as well as where does Kali play into all of this. And then at the end, we will give some time for Q&A. Great. Uh, hold on. Let me Oh, we'll minimize the video, uh, minimize the video for now. So roles that firms generally will be recruiting for at Georgetown. These, there's a wide variety, but the four big buckets are equity research. This is when uh, different analysts are analyzing stocks, right? How are they doing? How have they performed historically? What's going on in the industry to uncover treasure? Because equity research, what they provide is basically kind of a, manual for where you know sales and traders should be putting their efforts in to like short different stocks or buy other stocks things like that right so then there's also asset and wealth management and really you're making other people's money work for them um, you could be doing this for high net worth individuals sometimes you could be doing this for institutions we'll talk a little bit about that later uh, and then investment banking which you know i know a large number of people are very interested in. And essentially, you can think of it as the real estate agents of the finance industry. And then finally, sales and trading. Uh, generally, it's kind of like that image of trading on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, but there's much more to it that I'll go in depth into. So, uh, so first things first, equity research. So what do they do? Equity research analysts, they analyze small groups of stocks and their goal is always to provide the, mo to provide the most in insightful investment ideas and recommendations to the firm's sales force and traders, right? So their research reports will place buy, sell, or hold ratings on different companies. Uh, and you can really consider them the Wikipedia page of the bank, right? They're experts in specific companies and industries and you look to them to provide insight. Uh, when it comes to equity research, you'll generally work alone or in small groups. Your compensation is on par with investment banking, um, which is IB, but with lower signing bonuses. Uh, there's a pretty good work-life balance, in, as in you'll get home at a reasonable hour. Um, and the exit opportunities include hedge funds, buy side opportunities, some consulting, as well as fintech. So asset management, what you're doing is you're managing others' money, right? So you're investing clients' money to make sure that the return that you make from their money is enough for them to live off of or do something else with, right? right? So you're investing their money in securities, equities, debt, commodities, derivatives, so on and so forth. So you're generally purchasing on behalf of an institution or portfolio when it comes to asset management instead of an individual. When it's an individual, it's wealth management. We'll get into that later. And so when you're in asset management, you look at a plethora of like different financial instruments. It's typically long only. Only you want to have good analytical and people skills when it comes to asset management. Uh, the work week is around 60 hours and your exit opportunities include portfolio manager, economist. So one way to think about um, asset management is like, for instance, we have an endowment here at Georgetown, right? And so our endowment is 
I totally forget, but uh, there are people that do the work of asset management, right? They're trying to manage the endowment so that they're strategically investing in things that will provide a healthy return so that the university can use the money from the returns instead of ever having to dip into the actual fund, right? So that's what you would be doing if you were doing, if you're working in asset management. Moving on to private wealth management, right? So this is where you're managing the wealth of high net worth individuals. So it's individuals over institutions, right? This may be like the Jeff Bezos of the world, who knows, or other people, but uh, right, you're managing their money. So a lot of what it will be is cold calling and rejection alongside a lot of relationship building, right? Because you're in constant communication with your client about what it is you're doing, how you're making your their money work for them, right? And such and such. So you're meeting the needs of a wealthy individual and or and his or her family. Uh, funnily enough, like not only will you be using Wall Street Journal, but sometimes TMZ, the gossip site may also be helpful, believe it or not. And then exit opportunities in private wealth management generally include portfolio manager, consulting, as well as fintech. So Investment banking, the big one. So for IB, there's three primary tasks. You are creating pitch books, you're conducting modeling, and there's more administrative tasks. So when it comes to pitch books, it's, these are extensive, extensive PowerPoint reports for meetings with clients and prospective clients as well. And it requires extreme, extreme attention to detail. Things from like putting the right numbers in to making sure the font size is the same to like no random bolded letters and headers and things like that. Like anything and everything that goes into this page book would be your responsibility as an analyst. Of course, it's not solely your responsibility. You'll be working with others, but know that that's a big part of it. And then another part is modeling, right? You will need to learn how to master Excel in order to enter things like historic company data, fi uh, utilize financial statement modeling, conduct valuations, credit analysis, and whatnot. And then there is another part of it, which is administrative. So you Real talk, you do a lot of grunt work in IB, right? So what that means is you will be in charge of scheduling, of setting up conference calls, making travel arrangements. Uh, last part, right? Not so much right now in the pandemic, but who knows what that might look like. So that is IB in a nutshell. It is the highest paid, definitely, but it's also the longest hours. We're talking like 80 to 100 hours per week. Um, you know, I have friends in IB that say there have been weeks where they don't go home before midnight, right? Um, and that's just a part of the job. To be fair, um, like people go into IB for the broad range of not just exit opportunities, but also uh, exposure to different industries, right? When it comes to MA or restructuring, like you could be in the retail industry for one deal, you could be in the healthcare space for another and whatnot. I mean, sometimes, right, it depends. There are certain firms where they kind of lock you in into an industrial. But there are other opportunities where you may be able to like touch upon a multitude of different industries uh, and that may be very attractive. So in terms of exit opportunities, it is pretty big. So when it comes to IB, so former IB analysts, they go into private equity, which has been quite popular, hedge funds, consulting, fintech, venture capital, equity research, uh, boutique banks, you know, tech firms uh, and other large firms like the NBCs, the Disney's of the world, they're always looking for XIB to help run like their corporate finance divisions and whatnot. And then many people who have started in investment banking end up going into like entrepreneurship, right? Like they know the ins and outs of financial modeling of historical data and things like that. And it may provide them with enough intel to like start their own company, right? So these are all different exit opportunities that previous investment bankers have taken a uh, hold of. And then lastly is sales and training. So if you are in sales and trading, you're generally providing information about the markets and sharing recommendations given by the equity research team. So you guys work hand in hand. Your coverage includes hedge funds, mutual funds, and other institutional firms. Um, most banks hire traders for a specific area. That could be equity, that could be fixed income, derivatives, and whatnot. Uh, you strategize how markets may trade based on news, economic indicators, and any other influential factors. Like for example, 
example, um, I'm pretty sure there was an article that, right, uh, with everyone abandoning WhatsApp, uh, Elon Musk said he's been using Signal, right? And so what happened was there was a random company that was not the Signal that he was talking about, but uh, had Signal as a part of their name on the stock exchange and their stock went up, right? It didn't matter that it wasn't the company that Elon Musk was talking about. Their stock was still affected by his positive affirmation of like the name of that company. To be fair, the sh those shares definitely like righted themselves. Like, right, they went back to what they were before people mistakenly invested thinking it was the company that Elon Musk was talking about when it was something else. But that's just a small example of how, you know, like, news and general sentiment really can affect like the ups and downs of like a company of their shares and that's something sales and trading hones in on um <coughs> excuse me if you work in sales and trading you are likely to be extremely client oriented so you must possess not only knowledge of the market but also social skills so that you can interact with your existing and potential clients so your exit opportunities include a more long-term career at the bank hedge funds and consulting uh, so Rebecca Cassidy is our associate director of employer relations, um, and she has a really wonderful introvert to extrovert spectrum when it comes to these different finance careers. And so uh, what you can expect is like if you prefer working by yourself and you're on one end of the introvert spectrum, like more equity research is going to be along those lines and so, so on and so forth along with asset management. If you trend more towards like extrovert, like sales and trading, private wealth management are more like way on the other end and more trending towards extrovert is investment banking. Um, I will say, and I'll get into this later on, but the finance industry is a pretty relational industry, right? And even when you are going to be networking, it's a lot of building relationships. So know that that's not necessarily something that you can ever escape when it comes to the finance industry. I think, you know, if you were to be an equity research or asset management, I think the level of like, uh, interactions with people that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are less so, but it's not, it's never zero, right? That's what basically my point. Um, let me take a step back and say, there are definitely many more divisions and facets to the finance industry within these different firms that I have not mentioned, right? Like if you think about a full service firm like City, they have uh, divisions like corporate banking and things like that. I'm not covering them here, one, because some of those divisions are very specific to the full service firms, but two, the goal of this presentation and for me as an advisor is that I'm not trying to feed you the fish, right? I'm trying to teach you how to fish. So I'm hoping that these topics will give you just a general idea of what you can expect. And I'm hoping that you in turn can dig deeper into the research of where you would like to be in a firm, uh, based on like your research, based on, you know, articles that you read about a day in the life of like an invest investment banker analyst, banking analyst, or something else. Um, in addition, you through your networking and through the recruiting events you attend will learn for yourself what you think will be the best fit for you. So all of that is to say, it's totally okay if you don't have like the fullest grasp on, you know, the differences between all these different financial facets or things like that, that will come with time. Um, but know that you have to put some work into it in order to figure that out for yourself. So moving forward, you do not, like I said, right, you do not need to have all the answers before you step into recruiting. I cannot stress this enough. Um, like there are some people that know specifically the industrial, the firm, the kinds of deals that they want to work in. Great, great for them. Like if that is you, I applaud you. And like, I'm very happy for you. For everyone else that is not like that, that is 100% completely a-okay. Um, and the reason why I say that is because some part of this process is for you to learn um, and like to be open about it and to go through this process uh, while learning is beneficial for you and for the firms, right? And so that's just something to keep in mind. So which firms recruit here? This is a question that I get a lot. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is historically which of the different firms that have 
come here before. So within the bulge brackets, we send a lot of alum to Bank of America, Barclays, City, um, Credit Suisse kind of, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, definitely Morgan Stanley, UBS, middle market firms, including like Jefferies, Mizuho, Stiefel, BMO, RBC. Uh, they definitely all come here year in and year out. And then we attract a few of the elite boutiques as well. So that includes Centerview, Evercore, Guggenheim, Perella, Weinberg Partners, PJT. Uh, some of our students have ended up at Lazard, even though Lazard doesn't really recruit at Georgetown per se, but our students have ended up there as analysts. Uh, so there's something there definitely too. So how do these firms differ from one another, right? Um, a few big things. So one deal size, how much are the deals worth, right? They're like, if you are just a larger bank and you're moving larger, like larger, uh, larger sums of capital and whatnot, then your deal sizes are going to be bigger, right? Um, and that's just dependent on the kind of firm that you're looking into. It may not be that the largest deal sizes are always like the most uh, enticing. You may want like more mid-range deal sizes, right? That's up to you to figure out. Geography, where do firms have a presence, right? So um, BMO stands for Bank of Montreal. RBC is Royal Bank of Canada. There's also um, like uh, HSBC, right? And there are all these different firms where some of them have a very global presence, right? All the bulge brackets do, but then there are some firms that are more like uh, Canada-based, right? So for example, right, RBC, BMO, there are some that are more Asian-based like Mizuho and whatnot. And so depending on where firms have a presence, whether they're like more regionalized versus international in scope, that's also that also affects like how these firms are categorized, right? Whether it's bulge bracket versus middle market or whatnot. And then services provided, like, are the firms full service firms like City, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, right? Or do they only specifically do something like M&A and restructuring or whatnot? And so that's also a way that these firms are different from one another. Cool. So moving on to the types of events that you can expect to see this upcoming year or sorry, upcoming, well, upcoming year, but also upcoming semester. So first, firm-wide sessions. So firm-wide sessions are the most typical event. And what uh, different firms will do is their recruiters, as well as alums, most, most of the time, they will provide like anywhere between an hour to an hour and a half long worth of presentations, uh, as well as like time for networking at the end. They will talk about, you know, the firm, what you can expect from the firm. Uh, alums will give their personal perspective on like what my career has looked like, why I chose this firm, so on and so forth. Um, and then more importantly, HR representatives will talk about the timelines as well as the application process to be aware of. Um, so I would say like specifically, if you're very interested in a firm, absolutely attend their firm-wide session. There are certain things that you can glean from a firm-wide session that you can't always glean just from like reading the website, right? And so I highly encourage you to attend these sessions when you can. I know that there's a lot of them and there's absolutely no expectation on anyone's part for you to attend all of them. But to the best of your ability, especially if it's a firm that you're really invested in and you know feel like would be a good fit for you, definitely attend. The next kind of event is our coffee chats. So they're usually held by current first and second year analysts and or associates who are also Georgetown alum. The reason why they're Georgetown alum is because one, it's really not hard to get Georgetown alum to want to return to um, Georgetown, right, in the pre-pandemic days. Uh, but what that means virtually is that they're likely going to be the ones spearheading the coffee chats and whatnot. Uh, they will, you will usually meet either one-on-one -on -one or in small groups with other students um, in person. <laughs> there would still be an absence of coffee, but virtually there will still be an absence of coffee. But really what this is, is it's an opportunity for you to have like a very more personalized experience talking to someone from the firm, right? You can effectively ask them things like, you know, during your time at Georgetown, what do you think were really like uh, worthwhile experiences that you would encourage any student to take away? How did you you know, pick this firm above all the other firms when you chose to recruit here, things like that. So coffee chats are a really great way to network and connect with someone from a firm. 
And then the last thing is that there are other like more overarching networking events that different firms will hold. So there's a lot of, sometimes there are like networking roundtables where you can explain different industries and practice groups within a firm. I don't really think we'll see much of that. Like I think there will not be specific events tailored to Georgetown per se, but what I am seeing is that different firms are just holding like webinars so that you can hear from like a chairman of their bank, or you want to learn about like diversity, equity, inclusion at another firm. Uh, the thing about it is that these those kinds of events are very open access to a number of schools. So it's not necessarily a targeted Georgetown audience kind of event, but it's definitely still worthwhile um, to check out, especially if, again, you're specifically interested in a firm. Um, there will be other workshops that are more educational that help you in the application process. So uh, some firms have held, held like, how do you network? Uh, some firms have done like, here's how we want you to structure a resume. Um, other firms, many firms often do like a interview, how to and tips kind of workshop. So uh, just be on the lookout. Those will all be in handshake. So be on the lookout for these firms. Um, I will send you all the slides, so I'm going to quickly go through them, but this is just to give you an idea of which firms will be holding things virtually. So first note is that all of these times are in Eastern time zone. So if you are not currently in the Eastern time zone, sincerest apologies, I know it's rough for sure. Um, however, this is just a circumstance of like what it currently is. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. And then two, times are subject to change at the discretion of the firm. A lot of times when firms are holding events, right, it's dependent on someone's availability. But God forbid if something like hits the fan or whatnot, a firm may opt to move their coffee chats. Eh, probably not likely, but they may opt to move like a firm wide session, right? Or whatnot. Um, these are things that like we don't have control over as Georgetown because again, right? All of these things are very firm dependent, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, one thing, it, one, one of these events that I want to point out in particular is City. So they have coffee chats from 12 to 2 p.m. February 16th. And I believe you can register for those coffee chats through Handshake in like a jobs posting that's already online. So uh, I would encourage you to do so like after this webinar. Great, moving forward. So next uh, set, be on the lookout for these firms, Bank of America, BMO, Mizuho, Houlihan, Loki and whatnot. Um, so I'm sure one thing you may have noticed is that there are a lot of the bigger players that or elite boutiques that aren't on here, right? Goldman Sachs, not on here. Barclays, not on here yet um, and whatnot. Just because they're not on the list doesn't mean they don't have an intention to recruit and get to know all of you. Uh, part of it is like for some of them, they're just trying to figure out, right? Like when is it best for us to hold these events? When do we have the time? When can we gather all these Georgetown alum and so that they can interact with current Georgetown students? The other thing is that Recruiting for finance is a bit of a marathon, right? So we, like, if you look at these slides, BN, BNP and then UBS, they start like within the next two weeks, right? Um, however, if you look at these times, it ranges from throughout the course of February into March. And I bet, I would bet a lot that we'll see uh, information sessions and perhaps coffee chats into April as well. It's just very much a marathon. And so don't be dejected if you don't see your favorite firm on this list. Like we're still getting and receiving requests for information sessions and coffee chats on like a weekly basis from these different firms. The best thing you can do is not only, you know, pay attention to these dates that I have listed for you here, but also like keep an eye out on Handshake, right? Regularly, just make it a habit to regularly check the event section of Handshake. I also have a weekly business finance and consulting industry newsletter. I can't link it right now because it's right, I'm on the presentation, but if you Google like Kali Career Education Center industry newsletter, it will take you to the page where you can sign up for the newsletter. Um, I'd recommend signing up. Like I 
If you want to read my from the advisor section, great, you know, put a lot of effort into it. If you don't and you just want to skip down to the events and job section, totally fine. My feelings won't be hurt either way, but it's a really nice weekly newsletter where I give you the ins and outs of right what events are going on are there diversity programs you can be applying to what are the deadlines and so it's a nice way to just kind of check in in addition to like looking at handshake and you know like carving out some time in your calendar to make sure you are updated great moving forward so why attend these events there's a lot, I'm sure there's going to be Zoom fatigue. You're all right, like Georgetown is not an easy place, right? When it comes to academics and whatnot. Um, what I would say and encourage you to do is to strike a healthy balance between uh, your virtual academics and schoolwork as well as recruiting, right? The thing about finance is that it is really important to get your foot in the door your junior summer, because many of these banks, their goal is to convert their summer cohort analysts into full-time analysts. So that's why a lot of these firms are like appearing, right? They're holding all these sessions because their goal is to recruit you to become a junior summer analyst. Um, you're gonna do a great job because I know you will and you'll convert to a full-time analyst. And for them, most of that effort in recruiting happens right now versus like going through the same process for like seniors. So with that in mind, if you are just even a slight bit interested in finance, I really encourage you to attend at least a few networking and recruiting events this semester, simply because if you miss the boat now, there's still a few more opportunities in the summer as well as in the fall, but a lot of it happens your sophomore spring and you just, you don't want to miss out. Um, so why attend, right? Uh, attending these events mean you get to one, learn about a company, its culture, the opportunities, right? What are the interns that they're looking for? What mentorship structures are there? So on and so forth. Two, you get to demonstrate your interest and make a first impression. It's, you know, some part of it not being in person gets taken away, but you absolutely still do get to make a great first impression, even if you navigate recruiting virtually. Definitely keep that in mind. And three, network, right? You get to network with employers as well as Georgetown alum, um, and making these connections really will help you down the line. So why is networking critical, right? Networking is critical for finance. Um, it's critical, I mean, it's pretty important in general when you're searching for an internship or a job, but it's, ex it's especially critical for finance, okay? So first things first, data collection, right? Every bank that, uh, so you may not like every bank that recruits at Georgetown. And so you, I would encourage you to network so you can collect information to figure out like what do you like and not like about the role and about the firm, right? Networking, having conversations with people, asking them like, what is your day-to-day -day life look like? What are some projects that you've been really proud of? Where do you see the firm going, right? When you ask all these questions, it's a way for you to collect data, for you to make a decision about whether or not you would like to apply to a firm or not. I know that some of you may be thinking, Julia, I will apply to every firm. And that's fair. Like, if you want to do that, I will not stop you. I mean, I can't stop you, right? But when that happens and you're not allowed, like, and you, like, I've rarely seen that done and like done well, right? You can apply to every firm, but you're going to lose a bit of that personalization that comes from the effort that you go into, like the effort that you put into networking. Oh, and or you will burn out really quickly because that takes a lot of time and effort and emotional investment on your end. So those are just things I want you to keep in mind. Um, networking is also important and critical because it helps you set yourself apart, right? When it's time for your application to be reviewed, people will hopefully remember the impression you left on them and that they'll vouch for you. So this is also key. So let's say I'm Goldman Sachs. I have a position uh, I'm trying to recruit like 10 people for my investment banking summer analyst position. And I have uh, over a hundred applications. Um, I need to go from a hundred applications to 40, uh, 40 first round interviewees, right? I'm just making this up. 
these are by no means real numbers. I'm just trying to provide an example. So take it with a grain of salt, right? I need to whittle down over a hundred applications to 40. I'm the recruiter and maybe I've gone from like a hundred to 75, but, but between 75 and 40, that's still like 35 people or rather that's 40 out of the 75 that I'm still not sure who I should offer an interview to, right? This is where networking comes into play. Let's say I reach out to, you know, the Georgetown recruiting contacts that I have, like alum that I know are currently engaged. And I ask them, hey, what, like, who did you talk to? Who's left a good impression? Who could you see working here or whatnot? The people that you end up networking with, if those are good conversations and you jive really well, they're going to say, oh yeah, I totally had a conversation with so-and-so. They made a great impression. Let's definitely give them a first round interview, right? That's just one example of how fostering relationships through networking can come into play and bear fruit later on, right? I'm not saying that this fake conversation is how it happens at every firm, nor can I say that like it's at the point where they're trying to whittle down applications and converting them into first round interviews. Like, like someone can vouch for you between like your application and your first round interview or your first round interview and your super day and so on and so forth. I can't pinpoint that that's different for every firm, but the greater point that I'm trying to make is you set yourself apart when you network and it does bear fruit. You can't necessarily pinpoint where, but it does help. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, why networking is critical. It's an established part of the process. Like I mentioned earlier, finance is a very relational industry and you can bet that every alum that you've talked to, like all the managing directors who, you know, may present information about the firms during your firm wide sessions, they've all, they have all played this game. So it's not new and like, it's just part of it that you're going to have to grasp. And then finally, this is only the beginning, right? Like I said, finance is a super relational industry and it's relational with the colleagues that you spend, you know, over 40 hours a week with working on pitch books and deals. Um, it's also like incredibly relational when you build relationships with clients, right? And you're trying to sign them on as like a high net worth individual whose money you want to manage or something else, right? So this is only the beginning. Like if the idea of this much networking and talking to people tires you out, really consider what it is you want from uh, your role in this kind of industry. Because I can tell you, like I said earlier in the introvert to extrovert spectrum, right? Because like within this industry, there's that introvert to extrovert spectrum, but there's no role where like you're happily on a computer alone, not being bothered. Like there will always be that people aspect of this industry. So that's something to prepare for. So moving on, how do I network, right? So a few things, one, have goals in mind. Like I said earlier, every interaction is an opportunity for you to formulate answers to one of these questions in an interview, because you can bet they will ask you these questions. Tell me about yourself. Why are you interested in this role? Why are you interested in this firm? Why finance, right? Or like why investment banking, why sales and trading, yada, yada, you get the point. So when you go into networking, you can strategically ask questions that help you formulate the answers to these questions, right? And so, for example, if I'm talking to an alum, I might ask them like, hey, why did you pick um, Morgan Stanley over all these other firms? What stuck out about what stuck out about this firm to you, right? Whatever answer they provide, I can take some version of what I learned and input that as my answer to why this firm, right? Because effectively this alum just told me what stuck out to them about Morgan Stanley. And I mean, I'm not gonna copy his answer verbatim, but hopefully what he said is enticing enough that I wanna make it part of my answer when I respond, right? It could be that, you know, for every single person that I've interacted with along this finance recruiting process, they've, they have all been so incredibly encouraging, but also so sharp. And I would love to join a firm that will allow me to be like that as well, right? Again, I'm spitballing here, but you get the point. Um, another important part of networking is staying organized and being prepared. So um, many students who have gone through this process really recommend that you keep and maintain an Excel spreadsheet with the names, contact information, roles, and responsibilities of everyone you meet. I know this sounds tedious, but um, 
this is that attention to detail that I mentioned earlier, right? Um, if you can start that process and that and demonstrating that characteristic now, it's going to serve you well um, because you it it doesn't look good if you I mean like a very obvious mistake would be addressing an email to the wrong person, right? But a not so obvious but still subtle enough mistake is if you talk about something like if you refer to a conversation that you had with someone else in the wrong person's um, email response, right? Like these things happen um, and you want to do your best to stay on top of things so that they don't, right? Uh, <coughs> so along those lines, you want to do your research ahead of time and make sure you have a list of questions ready for your call. Uh, definitely take notes during and after the call so you can stay on top of what you talked about. Um, immediately write a follow-up email, uh, once, what, especially when the conversation is fresh. And then finally, I really want to stress quality over quantity. You are ultimately cultivating relationships and networking is not just like a cult, like you collecting these contacts because people can tell if you're just feigning interest, um, just so you can get something out of it, right? Like no one likes a brown noser, let's be real, right? And so, I know it may seem like, oh, if I talk to like 10, 15 people from one firm, that's got to up my chances, right? Perhaps, but honestly, like having a few tight knit connections that are like going to be your cheerleaders from day one, they are going to do so much more for you than like 10 people that only feel lukewarm about their conversation with you. So all of that is to say that really stress quality over quantity. If you have someone who you connect with really well, really think about like, okay, how, you know, what can I offer this person? Or how can I be empathetic, right? And like really show that I'm listening and taking in like the things that they're telling me and continue the conversation. So again, just some things to keep in mind. So the networking learning curve, um, this, what basically this graph says is that in the beginning, it is once you start, you are going to feel incredibly awkward. And you know what? Everyone goes through this. So you are not alone if you feel awkward. Let me just get that out of the way. However, what is encouraging is that it's an exponential decrease in feeling awkward the more networking conversations you have. So the first one or two or three you're probably going to be getting your bearings. You may or may not have ever had these kinds of conversations before. It is completely understandable if you flub a little, or maybe there's some awkward silences, like that's life, right? Um, however, I one thing that I've seen from students that I've advised before is they really do all come back to me and tell me something to the effect of Julia, like it definitely got better, right? Like the first few, eh, but the fifth, the sixth, and so on and so forth, I got it. Like I figured it out. And it looks a little bit different for every single person in terms of like, what's the unique kinds of questions they like to ask or like, how do they like to transition from, you know, the small talk into the question asking portion of the call. Everyone has a different way of going about it, but rest assured, everyone does develop a way to go about it um, one way or another. So just know that in the beginning, it is going to feel awkward, but the more you do it, the better, the, seriously, the better you will get at it uh, and the more you'll know how to navigate uh, these kinds of networking conversations moving forward. So what does this actually look like, right? And so I've broken this out in the kind of a chart so that you can get an idea. So um, there's two different ways. So first, I'm just going to start with attending a firm-wide session. So uh, you're an eager beaver, you attend a firm-wide session. Um, some of them, right, like are attended by alums. And so you get contact information like an email address from an alum. What you do is you send your contact said alum an email asking them if they're available for a 15-minute call. Hopefully they respond. And then from there, you then have the call with your contacts and you wow them with your stellar, really well thought out questions. Immediately after you send a thank you email to the alum and then you ask if they could connect you with someone else. Um, some example, like some version of this could be like, you know, thank you so much for your time this past Friday. I really enjoyed um, our conversation and I learned a lot from how you really utilized your story of like 
this internship and pivoting into finance. Um, you mentioned that you work alongside so-and-so who works in this. I was wondering if you'd be able to connect me with them so I could also like learn from them, right? And so hopefully they say yes. And then that's where this arrow comes into play where the, the new contact, you send them an email asking them if they're available for a call. And then this process kind of rinses and repeats. Um, Another, just to highlight, another way that you can also secure contacts is you can reach out to alums through LinkedIn or Hoya Gateway. Um, this is also another thing that students have done in the past and it's worked really well. So, uh, and, but then that right goes straight into the same process of sending the contact an email, having the call, sending a thank you email, rinsing and repeating. So the email, um, this, I'm going to say that this is just like one version, right? Absolutely tailor it to make it your own. Um, I adapted this from Jacob Worden, who is a senior at the MSB, who will be working in Guggenheim. We um, have worked together to create some versions of these uh, presentations before, and I'm just I just want to shout out that Jacob is a really great resource. He's a peer advisor for MSB students. So um, if you can meet with him, he's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I totally copped a part of his networking email because I really liked it and infused it with some other parts. So I just want to get that out of the way. So in terms of the email, this these are some components and I'm going to go through it just section by section. So uh, I have Julia Shi to analyst at financial firm, right? So you want to get the email address from networking events and or you can kind of hack email addresses. Um, so like so, a lot of emails are some version of like first name, last name at firm.com. I, given how receptive most uh, alum are to you reaching out to them, I would say like hack email addresses as like a last resort, but know that like that is something that people have done successfully. But anyway, so uh, with the header in particular, I want to stress that uh, mention specifically that you are a Georgetown student and that you're interested in whatever it is, right? This one is IBE, but you could say s &T or whatnot at financial firm. The thing about this is that, and the reason why we stress that you reach out to Georgetown alums is uh, when you network, you're really essentially trying to establish some kind of emotional connection with someone, right? With alums, it's really easy because the immediate emotional connection you can establish with them is the fact that you are currently attending the same place that they spent four wonderful years, right? So in the header, when you write you're a Georgetown student or in the email where when you write that you're studying such and such at like the college or the MSB, or SFS or NHS, like for them, that brings them back, right? To like their time. And the other thing is like, Georgetown alum want more Georgetown students to work in their companies like there's no alum who like would rather see like like if I'm a Georgetown alum I don't really want to see more like NYU students right I want to bring on like fellow Georgetown alum and work with me right because we're a great school Hoya Saxa so um that's why we encourage you to reach out to alum um when you're networking so uh always include just like a quick intro of who you are right your year uh, what you're studying, kind of like, why are you emailing them? And then the body paragraph is just a simple two to three sentence, like acknowledgement that they're busy, but making the ask. Uh, in this specific example, I say, like, are you available for a 15 minute phone call in the coming weeks to speak about your experience at the firm? I understand you must be busy, right? Practice empathy in that regard. Um, and that way you're very specific. Um, 15 minute phone call tells them like, okay, this is how long I can expect the phone call to be uh, in the coming weeks is like, okay, here's like where I can aim to schedule this phone call. Like it's the difference between like, oh, I'd love to have a phone call with you sometime. How long, right? Like I'm in IB, I don't have that much time to spare. If you tell me 15 minutes, okay, that's not hard for anyone to give, right? 15 minutes of their time. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're writing this email. Uh, and then coming weeks, right? Then you say specifically like, hey, preferably in the next few weeks, could we talk versus like, oh, you didn't give me a time. Well, then I'll just get back to you, you know, a month from now when this deal is over and then maybe they forget about you. So that's why you just want to like subtly put these hints of 
uh, how long you want to speak for, when and whatnot, because it you know helps get the process going. Uh, you can attach a resume, which I encourage you to do so in PDF format because Mac to Windows always has issues. So just be safe, put it in PDF format. Um, and then a few other things. So aim to send your email first thing in the morning. Um, there is a Google send option through Boomerang where you can schedule your emails. Schedule it for like not exactly nine in the morning, but something like 9.04, right? 843 just so th like it's a, there's just something about like nine on the dot you can't you absolutely can i mean don't let me stop you but it's just more likely that more of your emails are sent not like on the dot at 9 or 10 a.m but like some random number following it right but aim to send your email first thing in the morning because that's what many people do first thing right they always check their email um i'm that's not to say that someone wouldn't respond to your email if you send it at like thursday at 2 p.m but it's just Sending it in the morning, I think uh, it follows people's different like workflows and rhythms. And then the big thing that I wanna stress here is that this is a very short and quick read. You do not need to try and cram a cover letter into an email here. This email does not need to be longer than like six or seven sentences max. Like if you, if it looks very crammed and it's very word heavy, you really like, you don't need to like, you know, save the meat of that message for when you're actually in conversation and be brief, succinct uh, and thorough with what you're writing when it comes to your networking emails. Cool. Moving on. So uh, the phone call, right? Once they've said, yes, I would love to have this conversation with you. Uh, now, how do you approach the phone call, right? Start with small talk first. Do not just launch into like, okay, so tell me about this, right? No, like, would you do that in a normal conversation? Probably not, right? So start with small talk. Thank them for taking the time to speak with you. Briefly mention something that the two of you may have in common. So um, like I, for example, I'm originally from Michigan. I went to U of M, go blue. So I would probably like, if I ever find out anyone's from the Midwest, I always talk about like the Midwest, right? And things like that. Um, it may be that you have something else in common with someone like uh, maybe miraculously you two attended the same high school. That's crazy. Totally something that you could talk about, right? Um, but just to, that just gives you an idea. Like I'm not saying this needs to be a very long part of the conversation, but at least like some kind of small talk to like warm up the environment, so to speak, right? And then as you transition into asking your questions, you wanna end the small talk section with your elevator pitch. It should be no longer than two minutes. Um, and it's, it's a combination of what do you study? What kind of activities are you involved in? And why you're interested in finance? From there, you transition seamlessly into asking questions, right? What is it that you wanna know about their experience? What's their idea of a competitive candidate? Um, you know, Whatever questions you have, this is the time to ask them. I want to note that use your questions as a loose guideline for the conversation. Like um, if the conversation starts like tangentially going into another direction that's still finance related, you don't need to like stick to the three to five questions that you have. Allow them to take the, con like allow whomever you're networking with to take the conversation kind of where they want to go um, because it's better for you, right? Like, uh, you don't want to like kind of cut off or ruin their vibe and then like go back to your questions. I mean, they're like, allow them to finish saying what they want to say and then naturally go back to some of the other questions you may have. Or like, if you don't get to answer or ask all your questions, that's the perfect reason to be like, this was so great. Um, I had a few more questions that I wanted to ask you. Would you be available for like another 15 minute phone call, maybe two weeks from now? And then, hey, that's another way you get to prolong the conversation, right? So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, one thing that I want to say is like, think critically about the information they provide and be flexible and adaptable based on the conversation. Like if Someone was just telling you like, oh yeah, this is kind of, you know, what my colleagues and I do in the virtual space and whatnot and how we've been enjoying each other. Maybe take a second to think about like, oh, now that they've told me that, do I really need to specifically ask them what the firm culture is like? Or have I gained enough from that one anecdote that I can kind of understand and then move on to another question, right? Critical thinking is pretty crucial in 
like not just investment banking, but just in finance in general. So like learning to exercise that just even in a conversation is going to be helpful. And then once you're done with the questions or you find that, you know, there's only a few minutes left, you want to begin wrapping up, right? Emphasize any next steps that you can take and or recommendations they provided. Like if they're like, hey, check out this, you can end the conversation to say later on, like, oh yeah, um, I'll definitely check, you know, mergers and inquisitions out like you recommended because uh, I it must be a really useful resource if you mentioned it right something like that um in the call you can say like is there anyone else they recommend you get in touch with and hopefully they may refer you to someone else and you can bring that up in your thank you email and then finally you want to thank them again for their time um I know that I started I like mentioned you should start and end the phone call with this people like human psychology wise, people like being thanked and people like when you ask them for advice. So doing these small things hopefully endears you to the alum that you're talking with in some shape or form. So that's just something to keep in mind. Cool. Um, so I'm gonna run through the resources really quickly just because I'm cognizant of time and I know that there are some questions that were asked. So I will send these slides to you, so don't worry too much. Um, but I'm gonna say one, make sure you have your profile completely filled out in handshake. So, you know, putting the activities that you participated in, making sure that your industry interests and things like that are all filled out because it's going to help you a lot. Um, alum, right? Like there are people that you absolutely can reach out to, network with when it comes to recruiting and whatnot. Um, specifically, and then I'll get to the fellow students part, but there are other websites that I would encourage you to take a look at. Mergers and Inquisitions is a pretty good one. Wall Street Oasis, Wall Street Prep, Investopedia. From these websites, you can learn more about like the different financial paths that you can go into, as well as things like behavioral interviews, technical interviews, how to approach them, what's worked for people, so on and so forth. Um, cool. So just two Kali events to keep in mind. Um, if you are, I mean, if you are an MSB student, you are more than welcome to attend. Um, but we have like a finance recruiting for non-MSB panel tomorrow. And really what we're going to be tackling is like, so you're not a finance major, that's not a big deal. Here's how like these non-finance majors navigated successfully into getting a full-time offer and like summer internship offers. So that's a panel that we have tomorrow. And then Thursday, we have a Women on Wall Street panel where representatives from Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, uh, City, as well as Stiefel will be on hand. These are grads from like 2010 to like 2018 throughout 2010 who are at different parts of their finance careers and are happy to like answer any questions you may have. So those are just some things to keep in mind, um, ways that we Kali can help. So application preparation, right? Um, we, I do cover letter and resume reviews. You can go into drop-ins and ask for that as well. We will, we also have like mock behavioral interviews and we'll open up mock technical interviews later on in the semester. Um, you can, the on-campus interviewing, you can skip that, forgot to remove that. Navigating the process. So we're happy to help you talk about like when you have an interview and, and it, Con conflicts with class, like we can help you navigate through that, how to communicate with firms, right? If you want me to read like your standard networking template, happy to do that. So there's a lot of ways that Kali uh, is here to help. And then I really wanna specifically highlight Alexa and Sylvie. So they are our finance peer advisors. And so Alexa will, they're both seniors. Alexa will be working in the fixed income sales and trading section uh, department division whatnot at Jeffries. And Sylvie will be working in investment banking at UBS upon graduation. They are two really, really great resources. And I would highly encourage you that if you have any uh, advising needs or whatnot to sign up with, sign up a, for appointments with them. They know exactly what it's like to be in your shoes. Uh, and they'll be able to give you just like real life experience about how they navigated the awkwardness of recruiting, right? Of those networking calls of how do you, you know, like make small talk in these instances and like does networking actually work, right? They are really wonderful resources. We're super lucky to have them on board this semester. So I would absolutely encourage you to sign up for an appointment with them through Handshake. Um, and then, so 
just the Kali recruiting team. There's me, I'm the industry advisor for business finance and consulting. Um, because we have Sylvie and Alexa on board for the next few weeks, I'm not taking many appointments. Um, I mean, absolutely, if you have any questions or a dire need, like shoot me an email, we'll see what we can do. Um, but my goal is to be able to provide helpful programming for you all, such as today, tomorrow, and the day after. Um, but definitely later on, as you're navigating like uh, interview conflicts or negotiating like between two offers, things like that, I'm definitely happy to help and meet with you. So me, Julia, I'm a resource. Rebecca Cassidy, she's our Associate Director of Employer Relations. She manages employer relationships and Kali policies. Patrick Danina is our recruiting manager and he manages employer events, interview schedules. Um, when we were in person, he managed booking interview rooms, but he's really great uh, to ask like recruiting related questions too as well. Okay, I know that was a lot. I know that we kind of rushed through the end, but hopefully that was, um, that gave you a good overview in terms of, you know, what to expect from recruiting.